my name's Glyn Pooley and I'd like to talk about art. This time my subject is... So we're inspired by artworks in the National Museum of Wales. Quite a broad selection. They've, it's, it's expanded the museum there now and it's quite got quite a comprehensive uh, collection. So I've just picked a variety which I find particularly inspiring as well and some which are you know, quite, quite broad. So, and we've got this beautiful picture um, by Rembrandt, painted in 1657. And you really only get to appreciate these fully when you're stood in front of them. Some artworks look great in reproduction, but others, you just have to stand in front of them. And this is one that's got that kind of uh, quality. You know, he's not known as one of the world's greatest portrait painters for nothing. When you're there, you really pick up on the, the character and the atmosphere of uh, the sitter here, Katrina Hugstedt, wealthy businesswoman, independent businesswoman there. And you pick up on her, some of her quirky personality, but get an insight into the, the culture of which she's kind of coming from. And, you know, there's indicators in that by the kind of dress that she's wearing and the fact that she's got a handkerchief, which is you know, a symbol of wealth. She's from a austere religious group called the, uh, the Mennonites. And they have certain kind of characteristics, as well as being particularly successful business uh, people. They, uh, they, they, they kind of stood out as independent spirits and to paint a woman of that in that way at that particular time is particularly fabulous to have that. And you've got these quirky insights as well, you know, like the, the parakeet on the left, which again gives us insight into a personality because that was kind of frowned upon to have a bird like that when she was part of that austere religious group. So it shows like who Rembrandt was attracted to as well. It reflects a little bit of his personality in that, that independence of spirit. And you connect that when you, when you actually see it. But what you can't really see in this image on the screen, but is the quality of some of the painting. The hands are absolutely beautifully painted when you're in front of them. And the little details, you know, like on, on the headdress and the gold parts that hold that to, onto the forehead, these are so finely observed that you get to see the, how he kind of put layers of paint on. And when you look at it, study it closely, you see in part, it's quite loosely painted as well. So, you know, this is someone, of course, at the top of their game that could edit information away to uh, make uh, make the thing, the whole artwork come alive. Uh, so, you know, standing in front of it will give you that opportunity. So, and then we've got, works by this chap, Richard Wilson. Um, someone who for many years, a little bit underrated in Wales. I think there's been a program recently on, I think it's the story of Welsh Welsh art, which is great to see it being out there on, on national TV again, because it is a relatively untold story. I think the last time any program like that was put out was around about 2000 with a chap called Peter Lord, and it was great that they included Peter in the in the program this time. But they mentioned Richard Wilson because Richard Wilson was kind of considered, if you like, the father of modern landscape. And he's an artist that kind of celebrated the landscape for, for what it is, rather than it being a kind of backdrop for some, you know, more classical scene. And you can see in this one, this is more like the iconic use of the landscape. He studied, he went over to Rome, he studied there, and he picked up, you know, the, the language of painting, the classical language of painting, which had been used by people like Claude and Poussin, whereby, you know, they studied light effects and the, the grandeur of the, the scale and the enormity of the landscape. But it was as a kind of stage set to a bit of action that was going on. But in this one, when he's studying, we make an artwork at Dennis Bran, he's come back to Wales and he gets really connected with the landscape of uh, of North Wales and just tries to show that the landscape itself has different characteristics and has its own kind of personality. Anyone that's been up to Llangollen 
you know, the International Music Festival, just being there and seeing Dinner's Plan on the Hill, it is something quite magical and mystical. So there's a, there's a few pictures by Richard Wilson in the uh, National Gallery in, in Wales. And, you know, you get to appreciate their quality again. He was also one of the founders of the Royal Academy as well. So, you know, his date is early, isn't it? You know, in, in the 17, you know, 1770 for this one. This, uh, the, you know, considering what he was doing, he often used to take these canvases as well, sometimes quite large, up the top of the mountain, up the top of the hill, and paint them on site, which is seems quite incredible. But when you're in front of it, you get to study the handwriting of his of his uh, artwork. You know, the way he painted trees, the way he painted leaves, the way he painted water. Something he picked up in Italy, but you see how he economical it is. And it's a great way for you to learn and for us to learn is to go in front, stand in front of these pictures with our sketchbook and just do some little drawings, maybe tonal drawings, tonal sketches. Study how these artists actually did it because you learn a lot from that and it shows how economical they can be. And then we've got this artist, Thomas Jones, as well. A very early, again, 1774. Thomas Jones was born in 1742. And he was a pupil for Richard Wilson. So again, he came from Penrose. He went up to London and then he went over to Italy to try and, you know, make it over there in Rome. Struggled because of the quality of the artists over there and the sheer amount. But he gets known for a different kind of artwork. But in this one, the Bard of 1774, he considered this to be his best work. Now, when we're, we're looking at iconic images, traditional images in Wales, you can see he's taken a, you know, a grand subject matter. You've got this bard with his hair blowing in a dramatic wind, stood on the edge of this cliff top. And it's, it's a kind of depiction of a play by, a poem by Thomas Gray, where he talks about the English placing a, the bard is placing a curse on the English evaders before leap, leap into his own death. Because the bards were like highly regarded in traditional ancient Welsh society. They were thought to be descendants of the Druids. And John Jones makes that connection, given the bards' this Druidic features, with long beard and a hooded robe, places him in a landscape with like stone henge in the background, which kind of suggests kind of antiquity. So given it this kind of extra weight and grandeur, so it's, you know, it's lovely to engage with that kind of a quality. So this is what he considered one of his best paintings, but he kind of gets known for these kinds of paintings now, particularly moving into the 20th century. It's almost hard to believe that this picture was painted in 1782, because at first sight it looks so modern, doesn't it? Uh, like I said, he went to study London, then he went to study in Rome, then moved from Rome to Naples. And it's in Naples that he may started making these kinds of uh, artworks. Primarily, they were made for his own self-joy. But what it does, it shows how he had a different way of looking. And he was kind of almost making a snapshot of the view, that he, these different views that he saw in front of him. Often they were rooftops around Naples from maybe his hotel window. But when we look at them, they've got some real amazing structural geometric structures to them. You know, the way the eye is led across these flat planes and the flattening of the, the different planes gives them this real modern appearance. He always uses this beautiful blue in the sky, which is like cerulean cobalt, which ironically brings that back to Wales when he paints some of his uh, paintings like this, it landscapes in Wales later on. But the way he's kind of really studied shapes and tones and the balance and the rhythm of shapes is what gives it this real modern quality. You know, if you think of the flat areas which are contained in the background there and look at the rhythm of the doors and windows as they kind of move towards us, they're just different tonal rectangles, which again is something very modern. But then he does kind of analyze little details as well in the walls and the textures of them. So he's looking at something which, of course, at the time, 1782, would not 
be regarded as a grand manor painting by any means, of course. So he brought these back and they stayed in his family house for many, many years. And then they come to light in the 20th century. Um, and then, of course, they're really appreciated in context from that perspective. We talk, we're looking into a, you know, a Welsh gallery, a Welsh kind of perspective and <laughs> looking at different icons. And William Dicey has, has kind of personified some traditional Welsh icons. William Dice was connected to the, uh, the pre-Raphaelite movement. So obviously when you're in front of it, you see that pre-Raphaelite quality where everything is incredibly detailed. But he's, he's made a kind of romantic image in lots of ways here of these two ladies sat doing their, their knitting on the top of a mountain with this grand scheme behind. But the kind of traditional dress, Sunday, be Sunday best, at least, you know, maybe semi-performance with that hat, has become an iconic dress and an iconic way to portray a Welsh, uh, traditional Welsh dress and for, for generations now. St David's Day, is, is quite a few people have gone out looking something like uh, this with a bit of a daffodil as well. So, you know, it just tells the story and some aspect into the culture of Welsh perspective. Interesting, you know, that these two ladies dressed like that are on, on top of hill, well, the mountain range, really, because the mountain range is something which is being celebrated, the landscape that is of Wales for generations now as well. And then in the museum as well, we've got a lovely selection of French art. Um, and this lovely artist, Arnaud Dormier, uh, was a French realist painter. And there's a couple of pictures by him in there. So they're very kind of lucky to have in a, that way. And we can thank the Davis sisters for this, that they were great patrons of the museum, and backed by a lot of Welsh, a lot of wealth, of course, from the building of the docks, etc. They had a certain kind of eye for certain artworks, as well as the traditional impressionist works, which we'll have a look at some of those in a minute. They also had this kind of penchant for the hard working, if you like, in you know, coming out of a South Wales industrial perspective. Um, I suppose it was a kind of socialist perspective as well, that they they kind of uh, sprinkled their, their taste over. And Onio Dormier was uh, an artist that was particularly socially uh, inclined. He documented the, the revolution in France in the 1830s, Napoleon Empire in the 1870s. And he earned his living through caricatures, as well. But this often got him into trouble, so much so he even had to spend a little time in prison, an artwork that he made of King, Lu uh, King Louis Philippe. So it just goes to show the power of art to shock, even in that those, those times right up until today, of course. But uh, looking at these, they've got, when you're in front of them again, you see a beautiful fluidity to the way he paints and a wonderful balance of uh, light and shade coming through. Um, as you do in this little one, it's just only a little painting, and it's kind of really uplifting. It's just a lunch in the country. There's no big social message in this one compared to a lot of uh, Dormier's works. But what you get to what, see is the immediacy of his composition and the immediacy of his brushwork when you're there. Little oil painting, of course. You can see how he's left the marks and how the uh, the, the painting's being structured, and you know. What makes the picture tick, if you like, what makes it work? The emphasis of the dark line around the, out of the fi outside of the figures, of course, is a unifying aspect of the whole painting. And that flowing line just get hints at the background, you know, some foliage and foliage out there. And then it's just a lovely study of the dog being fed on the, um, the table there. And you really get a feel for the atmosphere when you're in in front of it and the, and again the quality of the, the painting and the fluidity and the immediacy of which you, it's been painted it almost looks like an early impressionist painting you know and if you think about it painted at the same time that Edouard Manet was painted his Dejeuner Salerbe you know early forerunners to the impressionists 
that you know that became more known in the 1870s like Monet etc we look at right at the forefront of a certain kind of tradition in the way he was painting his artworks as well and then we've got some lovely other pictures in that kind of um, arena Jean-Francois Millet he painted these monumental peasant scenes this is 1871 which you could see he celebrated the hard work of the, the ordinary person working on the land and so you get that all those qualities in the artwork their heavy boots the roughness the hard the squareness the solidity of it but you also get this kind of compassion and warmness as well with the child wrapping themselves around their, their parents so there's a kind of real dignity in the picture so he had a real kind of love for the those people and a deep understanding with their roots and their, their community where they were kind of coming from and there's a few of these in the museum so again it just gives an insight into the mindset of the collectors as well and what they were trying to share as part of the heritage of the South Wales Museum of that particular as it's kind of evolved and then we've got another classic impressionist painting here the La Parisienne of 1874 Renoir. Everyone knows Renoir. I heard of Renoir, one of the major impressionists with Monet. It's again, when you're in front of it, you get to study all those lovely brush marks. You get to study the fluidity of it. And you can see Renoir started his career painted on ceramics, bone china, delicate, feathery kind of marks, and just gets extended up into this picture. It's a very delicate portrayal of the face porcelain quality but then as we go down into the dress we see the broken brush, brush marks one laid over the top of the other in the direction of the, of the folds of the of the dress and it kind of comes to life brought together as well by the the harmony with the background she's got a kind of radiant light around her but then a very subtle blue around the outside now originally had kind of a comp more complicated building structure behind that and you can just make out the remnants of this wall here repainted that out and just took it back just to this kind of soft and almost like misty background really so the attention goes on to the to the main subject and by giving us that kind of focus we can appreciate uh, the delicate quality in which the whole picture is painted now this is a kind of artwork that the, the louvre would be proud of and would love to have there so, you know, we can thank the Davis sisters for bringing these kinds of pictures over to, to Cardiff as well. So they're great to study. Another one, great to study. Paul Cezanne, considered the, uh, the father of modern art, just down the road. <laughs> the Francois Zola Dam. Cezanne had such an influence on 20th century artists, particularly of the first half of the 20th century, whether it be, you know, people like Picasso, Duran, you know, the, the, the list goes on and on and on because he kind of have a, just had a different vision. So it looks really kind of modern. Again, it's 1877. But he kind of broke everything down to shapes and forms and really analysed light for, for what it is. He also chose a subject and patted it over and over and over and over until he really got to terms with all the subtleties of it whether it be the, the, you know, the, the square, the rectangle, or the, the cylinder, which he was kind of known for. But he would just analyse light at a different time of day and just put the mark down that he saw in front of his eyes. And as it changed, he just slowly modulated it right across the scene until it's built up into these, these amazing structures. And then you, he offers like multiple perspectives and things like that, which, of course, influenced the Cubist's uh, work. There's a flattening in some parts of the artwork, but there's also a sense of three-dimensional perspective there as well. If you just analyse one little part of it, it looks flat and modern. I saw earlier with uh, the Thomas Jones uh, picture, but then other parts have got like 3D modelling. You got diff, you got shadows in it which are simultaneously going from different directions. So this shadow on this goes to the left shadow over this side go to the right shows light time space things are passing it's the whole thing is alive 
So all these things just led into artists of the early 20th century taking these concepts on and developing them further. So again, you only get to appreciate them when you're in front, in front of them and you can analyse the marks themselves. And then we've got Eugenie Carrera, beautiful artist, so sensitive, um, trained in the classical tradition, had a lot, an influence on the Impressionists, actually, because they, she taught at the uh, Ecole des Beaux-Arts. And it's lovely to see these sensitive subjects taking place, showing the mother and child. And he does have this wonderful way of showing uh, vulnerability, tender sensitivity, compassion in these wonderful oil paintings that often they're kind of monochromatic, but he gets achieves this tremendous subtleties and softness where the figures become almost like ghosts floating in space. You know, he gets this sense of fragility, but you can see that's rooted in, you know, really good drawing and understanding when you look at the hand there, just the shape of the thumb and the finger. It's all you need to get, show the whole aspect of the hand and then the baby's head up and so on. So this modelling is there, but it's just hinted at everything. And, you know, the softness of the handling when you're in front of him to see the way the paint's just being glazed one on top of the other. So you get this misty effect. It's just, it's just beautiful. Um, and he did a whole series of, you know, pictures of like vulnerable children um, and that connection between the mother and the child and the nurturing and the looking after and the compassionate element. And, you know, to do all that with just so few colours and just in tone, and then this ethereal softness is wonderful, you know. I always portray that bottle in the background with, there's hardly anything there, but we, we can make it out, we can see it quite clearly, just the highlight and the shape. So when you're there and in front of the artwork, you can really study how he did that, what he put in and what he left out. Often, it's what you leave out when you're making an artwork. When you, you know, if you say to someone, Jeff, <laughs> initially, paint a bottle with some fluid in it, may of course, something like that. They think about the outside, they put lines around it and all this kind of thing. You know, he's showing us there that you don't have to, you know, pare it down to the essence of what is need to be seen when you're just dealing with light and shade and it will speak for you you know and a lot of that's achieved by these soft grounds that he's kind of using underneath just building up one layer on top of the other and you can do that in oil painting beautifully you can do these wonderful glazes one soft over the top so they kind of blend and then he's got that beautiful intimacy in the center you know between the mother and the child so, you know, it's well worth a look if you get a, you know, if you're in there. Might, sometimes he's overlooked. And of course, you've got to mention Van Gogh because he's internationally renowned, of course. And they've got one of his final pictures that he painted there in, in the 18, 1890. Um, all the intensity of a Van Gogh is in it. Uh, you get to see the textures, you get to study the brush marks, you get to see, you know, the hand of the artist in play there. You get to see, you know, how connected he was with his canvas by how hard he's putting these marks on at times, etching into the surface as that rain kind of comes down and the atmosphere and the character uh, is all there. So, again, it's something lovely to have on our doorstep to go and perceive. And, and there's a lovely room of Impressionists in, in the museum and they are quite wonderful. You know, Monet was an incredible eye, as you can see. He loved painting water, he loved painting reflections and capturing those different kind of qualities. Venice was an ideal opportunity there. Slightly later picture, 1908. But the way he kind of captures light at a particular time of day and the colours that he's using as well. And, you know, he set a certain kind of colour, atmosphere, mood, and then he would stick to that. So in this case, it's kind of predominantly this blue colour. Um, and then you just have modulations of that blue with some of the reds. And there'd be a melody of, you know, based on blue, if you like. And then another time of day, it might be on pink or it might be on yellow. But when you're in front of it, you get to see the brush marks. That's the important thing. Look at an artist's brush. Try and understand an artist's hand, handwriting. That's what you're, you're really studying when you're in front of it. Uh, see how they write their 
their visual letters, if you like, if you can understand their handwriting, it kind of frees you out with your own work because you kind of just see that it is just paint on canvas uh, and it is a unique vision for each particular artist. But you get to study their characteristics. When you understand their characteristics, that will kind of feed into your, your work. I said often it's about what these artists leave out. It's about studying tone and tonal relationships. A lot of these artists are very good at seeing tonal relationships. And you're going to kind of train yourself to be able to do that. So it's, that's why students go to these galleries and make paintings on, on site, in situ. And it's a great thing to do. Just take your paints, go there, watercolours or something like that, and just make a study in front of the artwork. You get a much more personal relationship with that artwork then. And people respect that you're doing that and they just wander around you. So you get more chance to really study the artwork. But, you know, you really start to learn then because you can study each brush mark and study each tone. And it's just like learning so much rather than kind of having to invent it all yourself. It's right there in front of you. Sometimes there's a bit embarrassing maybe to do it on your own, but go together or get a couple of people go as a little team and, and do it. And it just makes it kind of more normal. But it's a beautiful thing to do. You don't have to be big picture, just a little intimate one, but really steady something specific that's the important thing something specific about that artwork that's in front of you you learn more that way and in this one again in venice these wonderful colors we get and we see but it's the marks isn't it you know there's all these delicate feathery kind of marks one laid on top of the other to get this kind of eminence this kind of glowing quality and when you're there you can see how those marks are laid on top of each other and then the, the visual effects that kind of comes from that. Amazing. And then the beautiful pictures. There's a few beautiful pictures by Gwen John. Uh, we studied, we looked at her work. She was from Tembe. Amazing artwork. Very, very sensitive. But, you know, she went to London and then, of course, to France. So she was well aware of the international art scene. She was connected to Rodin, model for him amongst other things <laughs> but then she had this other kind of otherworldly quality to her in the day her brother augustus john was kind of regarded but he said you know it's my sister that's going to stand the test of time and her work is kind of like visual poetry and um, again it's editing away information and you get a real insight into the character of the sitter and their sensitivity and their relatively few colors fantastic tonal balance that's what it is about again but you get to see how she puts the brush marks on where she puts the brush marks and kind of what kind of order when you're in front of it how it's kind of uh, built up what canvas she leaves what she covers you know how she covers them to get this real sensitive uh, image and approach and the tiny little delicate marks on the dress there all within a limited tonal range what you leave out says it all really get that quiet quality and then we've got this lovely artist james dickinson innes was born in Sinetli in 1887 relatively short life but left some amazing artworks he, he's built, been overlooked for many many years but you know he's starting to um come back online again if you like is i suppose basically his career was cut fairly short by the start of the First World War and his very short life, of course. But since then, it's kind of grown because of the, the lightness of the touch and the immediacy in which he kind of painted. You can see there's like impressionist qualities to this kind of artwork, but there's also another vision which is going on. It's like this mysterious vision that he's connected with. He went to study at the Slade and then went over to France and Spain and even Morocco to draw these, make these relatively small oil paintings. Some he worked up to slightly larger and he had exhibitions in London with people like Eric Gill. And he, he went to North Wales on a painting trip for a few years with Augustus John as well. Interesting to compare those, their two works, but Innes had this kind of inner vision that kind of transcends the landscape. And you see it, this was the French picture, but when you see this one of 
Arenig in North Wales. This became like his real muse, you know, he just loved this mountain. He just kept petting it over and over and over, you know, in a few within a few years. And you get this amazing melody of colours and this transcendent world, really. So all the mystery and the wonder of Welsh history, if you like, through the Mabinogion, all those kinds of literary pieces, they kind of come out in these in these works. It just takes it takes the whole landscape to another place. Anyone that's been to North Wales often, you know, it's raining, it's dirt, you know, it's grey, but not in in Innes's eyes, you know, it's something else. It's another it's another world completely, and such use of wonderful colours just you know stays you stays with you. But when you're there in front of them, you get to study them. You can also see the texture of the mark, the thickness of the paint the direction of the brush mark and how economically they're painted. And again, it's just something lovely to study in front of and, you know, draw away and bring that back and lead maybe into your artwork. And this is a lovely little picture. I just like the form and the figures and the modernness, if you like, of this by Christopher Williams. He was born in Meisteg and he uh, went up to London, studied again. You know, you'll see this often connection because very, very difficult for artists to live and uh, earn a kind of living in Wales and stay in Wales. So they kind of had these other kind of connections. But the colours in this are, are wonderful. It's a simple subject. It looks very modern, as I said, but you get, again, these other themes. You get the, the beautiful mountains in the background. You get this turning, turbulent sky with wonderful colours in it. You get this almost impressionist way of painting. The, the dress and the foliage with the, and the colours in the background. And Christopher Williams, again underrated, overlooked for many, many years. He made some lovely large paintings as well, based on Welsh history and folklore. You ever get to see them. But sometimes it's just these little intimate ones which just kind of sing off the wall. It doesn't have to be a grandiose subject. You know, you can see patted outside on the spot beautiful capturing of light, a bit like the Glasgow boys and girls we've looked at in the past. He's got the, that lovely, those lovely qualities and full range you get to see there in, in the gallery, the ex in Cardiff. And then John Piper, always worth a mention because John Piper did a lot of work in Wales and the National Museum have bought quite a collection of his work that he did in North Wales, like the mountain pictures or snapshots of mountains. And he became famous after the Second World War, painting the bombed out buildings, and he painted a famous picture of Coventry Cathedral and places like that. Uh, you get to see this his hand in the paint in this, where you know these wonderful textures, one laid across the across the other. It gets this kind of mystical feel in the paint as well, showing some parts of the canvas, letting that come through, as in this one of uh, Slantoni Abbey. That's a wonderful place in its own right, of course. It has an incredible sense of presence, and many amazing artists have painted that, including Turner himself. But you get to see this kind of quality of how he uses paint when you're in front of it. It's given this monumental, almost like as if it's made out of concrete, something very, very substantial there. But look how he's kind of etched over the surface with the air handle of his brush for the sky into wet paint and giving the tiniest hints of blue in the kind of greyness and the, the weightiness of the of the building. And he painted lots of amazing ecclesiastical buildings like this, as 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 well as his uh, landscape paintings. And I think he, he kind of used Wales as a kind of refuge from, you know, the Second World War. And that kind of comes out in his artwork. But again, another artist, lovely artist to look at and study. And they've got quite a few in the museum as well. And then everyone knows a Lowry, so it's great to know that they've got some there in, in Cardiff. Six Bells Abertaleri. <laughs> Lowry's just got his own painting language, isn't he? Again, it's the handwriting of the artist is there. There's matchstock men and cats and dogs, etc., all on the bottom there. But beautiful rendition of the valley as it disappears into the distance and is relatively 
few colors that are used, you know, primary colors, black and white, you've blended there. But it tells a good story, it tells a good story, and it also documents a time and a place very economically. And, you know, you again, you really see that when you stood in front of it to see how how he made the, the little shapes for the for the people and how he made the shapes for the buildings and how he used the tones for the for the, for the railway tracks etc um and you know it frees you out when you're in front of these artworks it gives you an opportunity to express and develop your own own hand visual handwriting and then you've got peter pendergast here he made some amazing artworks and blind for stig you know not the best image of this some of these are quite large in the 90s now that's a bit of a better image view from Bethesda. he was a kind of very expressionistic painting painter but he had this really immediate approach to the landscape layering paint one layer on top of the of the other and he really built it up he had a real deep connection with the, the slate mines and some elements of the hardness of the landscape but then he had a poetry to it with some wonderful use of colors that you put in so you can see all the immediacy the expressionistic approach at the top there but then you get these wonderful colors which appear you know the cerulean cobalt blue some some reds just a dot of red here or a bit of pink there which just adds to the poetry of, of the piece and when you're in front of it you get to really appreciate that these big pictures are fabulous sometimes just the small paintings that he made have got that extra bit of something and condensed into it. And Peter Pendergast was one of the group of artists that was celebrated for a short period of time with people like Francis Bacon. Bacon had then developed a course into this international phenomenon. Peter Pendergast, you know, again, left London, retreated more into Wales, but he left a lovely legacy of some amazing pictures of the North Walian landscape from this different perspective, you know, that again, the, the slate quality quarries and the harshness of the land but he gave it a lovely poetry and then we'll finish with this one iconic picture by kevin sinnott kevin is still going strong painting his pictures born in san and this is 1995 it's got a lovely humor to this picture but also you know it's a lovely documentation of the valleys he paints a lot of valley scenes and he paints a lot of characters and their lives sometimes the soap opera if you like, of the people in the valleys. It's a bit, anyone's seen the the, the television programme Stella or something like that? Or it's even a bit like EastEnders, you know, what goes on sometimes. But uh, he, capt he captures that with a wonderful quality. So the light in this picture is amazing. The the expressionist way he uses the paint is is great as as well. And he often has exhibitions in Martin Tinney's gallery in Cardiff, you know. And he paints a lot of pictures. Some are hit or miss, but the best ones, you know, they're very popular. And this one is particularly popular for the for the humour, the subject matter, and you know, the the light and the way it's kind of painted as well. All those things kind of coalesced in in this one. So it's quite a range of artworks, as you can see, from the traditional masters to some of the more modern Welsh artists. You know, so when you go to these to the gallery there. Consider what attracts you in the artwork. It might be a subject matter, it might be its style, and consider how that could help you with your own work. So why reinvent the wheel? And sometimes you go there, there's a lot of work there. Go to the gift shop, maybe, pick up half a dozen postcards, see which ones you really like, and just study them. Take your sketchbook with you, go and stand in front of them, and study something specific in that artwork, you know? whether it be one tiny section, whether it be a tonal relationship between one mark and the other, or whether it be a colour relationship, if you've got some pastels or paints uh, with you, just to see what really you're connected with, what you're attached to. And you'll get much deeper um, connect, not just a deeper connection, but you'll, you'll receive much more from that artwork. But because looking at art takes is, is rather demanding, just choose a few and go into the uh, to the bookshop or whatever and get the postcard is often a way. If you like this video, don't forget to subscribe and click the bell notification.